Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Ferzuha. This is Oran. I am an educator of philosophy based in Austin. I am going to continue talking about Hegel's science of logic with my dear friend, Tren. Hello, Tren. Hello, dear fam. Uh, this is Tren, your friend. Uh, and uh, I am a cultural historian of uh, early medieval Europe and late medieval China, also based in Austin, Texas, the United States of America. It's good to be with you all. In Indeed. So what we are going to do today is that we are going to start with a summary of what we have talked about so far and the main uh, steps that we have taken in uh, understanding Hegel's sense of logic. And then we're going to introduce uh, two important concepts, the concept of the other, the concept of change, and this will be and uh, this will be it for for um, today's discussion. From the beginning of our discussions, starting from the uh, book um, itself, we have made the move, like if you want to just like kind of throw this as like, the broadest way possible, we have moved from being to something, right? Nine to ethics, right? That, that has been the move. Now, each move Hegel argues or claims is imminent, meaning that we haven't just said, oh, being is like, you know, this description of being, okay, we don't like being, let's go talk about like nothing. This is not like a, you know, talking about different random concepts. There is a, there is a logic to it. There is a movement to it. And that movement is getting its, like the fire is from within. It's just, it's always getting its uh, initiation from where it is, not where it's supposed to be, right? There's no odds in this process. Now, being pure immediacy, why pure immediacy as a beginning of this whole inquiry? Because why start from anything more sophisticated? This is the simplest version of thinking about what being is or what is it to be? Pure immediacy, it just is. It just is without, you know, purely affirmative and just present and that's it, right? That according to Hegel and importantly, according to Hoga's interpretation of Hegel, um, it's just not coherent enough, right? Or it is not determined enough. It's kind of like dissipates. It doesn't, it doesn't, you cannot hold it together in any way, right? And because of that, being is, ends up being just nothing. Just being that it is too, being in this sense is too indeterminate to be anything meaningful. Right? But nothing is still is, right? As a being indeterminate or whatever other characteristic you want to uh, attach to it, nothing is not absolutely nothing in a way. And this point is going to become clearer and clearer as. Uh, we progress in the science of logic. So there is this indeterminacy that as nothing, but nothing still is. So, okay, what is, what is, is, quote unquote, is, it is being. What was being? Being was pure immediacy. You're back. And then this circle goes on. This circle of being vanishing into nothing, nothing vanishing into being, being, ending up being nothing, nothing ending up being being, is called becoming, right? And Becoming seems to be the truth of being. But in like, the lectures that me and Trent heard from uh, Holgate that is, you can uh, listen to is, is available on YouTube. Uh, Holgate mentioned a very interesting point about like the relation between Heraclitus and Parmenides, right? And this whole idea that, you know, when Heraclitus thinks of Becoming as the truth of being, uh, and that you know that kind of a stability of being that Parmenides has in mind, which probably has some important influence on Hegel's original conception of pure being in Hegel's uh, in in the science of logic. Uh, Heraclitus emphasizing on rejection of being and holding on to becoming is because he's still thinking of being in the same way that um, uh, Parmenides thought about being. The point is to realize that that being and that nothing are not what we thought they are, 
And because of that, the truth is not, the truth of being is not becoming, it's something else. Right. That realization comes from understanding that if being and nothing are vanishing into one another, that means they're not absolutely different. If they're not absolutely different, they are interconnected. We don't know what that means. We just know that there is no absolute difference between them. If there is no absolute difference, there is interconnection. If there's interconnection, we got to figure what that interconnection is. But for now, we know something. We know that it's, this is not just about constant vanishing. It's actually nothing really vanishing. We're looking at the coin, which is flipping the coin constantly and like different sides come up. That doesn't mean that one is vanishing into other. That just means these are two different sides of the same coin, right? We don't know what that means really, right? We just have an idea. And that basic idea is called Dasein, determinate being, right? The idea that there is an interconnection between um, being and nothing. Now in this new version of them that being and nothing are not absolutely different and they are somehow interrelated, they receive new names and those names are reality of negation. Worth of mention, worth, worth to mention that here is the transition that Hegel calls the term of being quality. Having significant changes in this process, but the way that Hegel talks about it is that reality is a quality with an accent on the affirmative and a negation is quality with an accent on the negative, right? It's um, that, that's how, how they are connected. Now, the whole thing, and this is the, I think, Holgate cannot love any term more than this, making something implicit, explicit. I think this is just, you know, now we are part of, the, the, he, he managed to transmit uh, the opposition to us because that's again, what how we are understanding it to an extent. That okay, we're saying that we've realized that reality is not purely affirmative and negation is not purely negative. And we have understood that reality and negation are interconnected implicitly. We don't know what that really means. And what comes after is just our continuous attempt to uncover something. What does it mean to say that reality and negation are not absolutely different and they're interconnected? Okay. And the move here, the next move, the, the first move in understanding this, you know, another layer of this interconnectedness um, takes us from Dasein or determinate being to something. Okay, there are two points that are important in it. Something. Number one, as there is no absolute difference between reality and negation, they are related to themselves while relating to each other. Self-relating determinacy. What does that mean? If you're really saying reality and negation are not absolutely different, but they are different, right? Uh, when they are relating to each other, they're also in ways relating to one, one another because they have each other as moments of each other. Like reality is not pure affirmative, which means it has negation in it, right? And negation is not pure negation. Um, it has affirmation in it. So when negation connects to reality, it is also connecting to itself. And when reality connects to negation, it is also connecting to itself. This connection that I'm talking about could be differentiation, right? And that's going to become clear in the second layer of this. But even in, at this level, we have this kind of a self-relation that in relating to the other in the form of difference, each moment is relating to itself. And because of that, we have a self-relating space that Hegel calls something. The second way to think about kind of the same thing, but maybe with, with an accent, is that negation to be negation must negate reality. Negation is the operation that differentiates, right? Not reality. That's what I am, negation said, right? In reality, we know is not purely affirmative which means only the only other, if it's not purely affirmative, the only thing that we have is negation, right? This means reality has negation. So when negation negates reality, through negating neg reality, negation negates itself. Right? That's why Hegel holds something, um, negation of negation or self-relating negation. That's where we ended. Before moving on to other, anything, 
Or, or attention, of course, you can only expect yeah. attention from me. It's like when you're when you're among your brilliant summary of what we um, achieved so far, or Hogan or Hegel has accomplished so far. You uh, emphasize it like while reading it, we are like subconsciously corrupted by uh, Hogan with that obsessive use of making. Implicit and explicit, which is really interesting because um, my motto as a cultural historian is to honor what a Sir Isaiah Berlin believes a good historian does, that is to make impl implicit parallels in social and cultural development explicit. There we go. So cultural history, philosophy, you can consider that are two Similarly, irrelevant categories, but they are connected in a very important sense, from which we can probably use this as an analogy to, to march on to the relationship between something and the other. What do you tell us there? Yeah, I, that's that's very good, and it is. I think it's in the, in the side of this. It is interesting to kind of remember what we discussed when we we're thinking about like the value of uh, the project of legal sense of logic, and, and we mentioned Nietzsche there, and I think. Nietzsche would have some issues with this obsession of trying to making things, making implicit, implicit things explicit, right? Mm -hmm. And this is a tangent on your tangent, but I think it's it's a tangent worthy of mentioning. Right. But uh, I remember Werner Herzog, which is my uh, with qualifications, of course, but like favorite living human being. Uh, he was. Uh, one time talking, not very, you know, he's a very provocative, like he just says stuff. But he was talking about, uh, you know, psychological, uh, like uh, psychoanalysis, right. right? And you can think about psychoanalysis also kind of like a little bit, uh, not a little bit, a lot like this. You want to make something implicit in your psyche explicit, like through like kind of deciphering different, you know, motivations and motifs and dreams and like whatever and Herzog was mentioning that uh, it is unbearable to sit in a room that is uh, completely lit wow. right but if er there is light everywhere that's suffocating and I think there is that trend that we need to have kind of like in peril in what we're doing have in mind that like what is the value of making things making implicit things explicit because right. that is not immediately clear that that's what we should aim for. But anyway, that's what Hegel does. And now we are uh, talking about him. And the next level of making something implicit explicit uh, gives us the concept of the other, which is an interesting concept. Now, the way that we have so far uh, we're able to make sense of this process, like make this process of, you know, implicit to explicit uh, clear for ourselves and kind of be remain, kind of, as, as best as we could uh, remain faithful to the idea of evenness is to emphasize on negativity because it seems like this negation, you know, we start from being, which is interesting, right? We start from a firm, pure affirmation. But after that, it seems like that the more we okay, go in, we are, we are getting more and more interested in just saying that, oh, but negation, what is negation again? And then we just do something with negation and then something opens up and then, you know, this happens. We're making explicit what negation really means. And the idea that we have arrived at, at which, which gives us the idea of the other and the, the idea of the change could be concisely put as unleashing negativity. Right? Now, I will read from what we have here in this slide, and then we will we will talk about this a little bit. Something, as we have said, is self-relating negation. We made that explicit by paying attention to what the moment of negation in Dasein really implies, right? Uh, that negation must kind of attack itself and with attacking itself, you know, this is purity and so on and so forth and relates to itself. Right? We haven't, however, unleashed, quote unquote, all that negation implies, right? 
negation to be negation, just you cannot just stop, right? And that's gonna be that's gonna be our point. If something is self-relating negation, the negation cannot stop at the level of negating the purity of the moment of negation, but it must also be applied to something as a whole. If, in other words, negation is a constituting moment of something, we cannot arbitrarily stop the negation at the level of something. If the something as a whole is not negated, negation is not really a constituted moment of something. The idea here is that we need to take seriously the point that negation is you know, negation. And if it is negation, it must be negation through and through. Like we didn't say that it is negation, but hey, you know, you cannot negate that. Like there is no, you know, we're not warranted to stop negation, right? And in that sense, anything that could be negated seems to be is uh, so subject to negation, right? And that as, Trent mentioned in the last episode could have like surprising interesting results in which that in that kind of a you know overpowering of negation actually implies negation of pure negation right negation must negate itself in the process so that means there is room for pure uh, not pure but impure affirmation as well but okay if we have done everything in this in the something layer of things in the sense of realizing that it kind of there is self-relation and there is this negation of negation in that process. Then we need to ask ourselves again that what is this negation? Right? What is this negation? And if this, this negation, if something's negation of negation, and negation is the embodiment of is a constitutive part of something, this negation should be applied to the entirety of something as well. Right, which means that there must be something affirmative that is not something. That is to apply the operation of negation to the entirety of something that has its internal structure already, which has a negation. But from that internal st structure, that negation erupts and and captures something in its entirety. And that is the beginning of the other, which we're going to talk about um, shortly. But I want to see if Tren has something to say at this point, and then, then we can talk more ex explicitly about other. Not really. Can we just uh, move on from here? Yeah, yeah, of course. And then I think that with, with the other... The, the, right. um, this slide maybe, and there is something more to be said. So the negation of something as a whole, which we had to do, if you wanted to take the um, take negation as a constituting part seriously, implies a non-something. By non-something, we mean, and we think Hegel means that you know, that kind of a, you know, that's just another way to say about something that, a negation of something, it's non-something, right? It doesn't have the something in it. And um, Hegel calls this non-something the other. Right? Now, the interesting thing is that this other is, and all the dialectical steps that we have gone through for something just applies to this. Other cannot be just pure immediacy, other cannot be a pure negation, other is determinate, blah, blah, blah. All of that happens. And going through all of that, that like a pro a process, we realize that because other is, other must have the same type of a structure as something. It must be self-relating negation. Right? Because that's, that's not, that was not a random thing that we got, at least the you know, claim is that. Uh, the idea is that we got to something because the whole point about pure affirmation collapsed. Well, what is this non-something? The non-something is, then what does it mean to say the non-something is? Well, we can say non-something is pure immediacy. 
and all the rest, right? So what happens is that other is other in the sense that it is the non-something, it is the contrast, but it is also, it has the uh, structure of something. But that just means that like from the viewpoint of the other, you know, remember that when we got other by saying that the negation must be applied to the entirety of something, right? If negation in other and like has the structure of something, then again, that must be applied to the entirety of other as well. So from the viewpoint of the other, the first something is an other and vice versa, which means any something is also an other. It is both, both the, it has both its structures. There's two ways of two accents again in, in, in a new way, right? As we discussed at the end of the last episode, any something has its internal structure independent from the other. How independent? It's you know up for further clarification. But definitely Hegel is not saying that, oh, something is waiting for something else to be contrasted with. No. Something is something, but others will come into place. So any something has its internal structure independent from the other, so does the other. Yet they logically, and based on the idea of unleashing negativity, also require, require an external contrast. External contrast just being negating the whole thing, right? Remember when we were talking about something, we were talking about something as having an internal structure. When I'm saying negating something, I'm saying something that is not part of that internal structure. Bingo. External is the birth of the external. First of all, external is just applying negation to the whole something. It cannot be internal. It must be external. It must be different in that way. And again, the beautiful idea of difference is back. Something and other are different in a new way. They're not absolutely different, like being nothing, or internally different, like reality and negation, but externally different, yet related. Like they're not unrelated so that there is no absolute difference between something and other but they're different they don't share the same internal space that could be one way to think about their difference there is a difference between internal and external and that means they're different but they are connected because to be what they are they need an other they don't need an other to have the internal structure in the first place but they need an other because negation is part of them and a negation must be applied to the entirety of something. Yes, I have two points. First is kind of a reaction to not only this slide, but also the previous slide. So both slides are on the other. So if we consider that, that's a way I make sense of it. So if we consider negation from the perspective of it's a difference making, and you see, made very clear that something as a self-relating negation, um, one negation is like an internal that it um, says no to that to the reality element of, of, of something that is an absolute um, affirmative side of that determinate being, but uh, that absolute the purity of category must be purged. But on the other hand, it also introduces the difference between something and what something is not. And then that, as you mentioned, is external. And that thing is not something, but it also is. Therefore, going through all the procedures sort of a mode of being, hence structurally parallel to something. And that is called non something, the other. So the two are reversible to each other. That's a, it's a, is that a, a, a acceptable way of uh, paraphrasing what you just said. And the second thing I want uh, to... Yeah. No, 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 you want to say something? Yeah, yeah, no, no, I want to say that, yeah, that's that's what I think is happening. Right. I don't know what I think about reversible. I just think that it is... Yeah, like... The, each something must have this other, 
but because the other goes through the same process, the other must have the same structure as something. And because from that perspective of that new something, there is a need for another other, the first something becomes an other as well. So they are not so much reversible that they just mirror each other, I would say. Right, right. Reversible. Yes, that's something I want to highlight. But um, I need to think more about that. But there's a categorical difference, I think, between this stage of a relationship between something and other, which Holgate at least calls a reversible relationship between the two, and the, uh, say, being and a non nothing, which he says that vanishes into each other in the sense that the pr more primitive stage of opposition, they cannot coexist as they claim to be. But at this stage, both something and the other or an other um, coexist and relate to each other in so doing introduce differences, uh, therefore make uh, activate or, or um, leaven that negation within uh, each other to make it to, to unleash uh, negation within each other for for, for themselves. Yes, so we we can think more and um, revisit this to whether yeah. so fitting to call it as a reversible, but I do think that's a um, different relationship between different uh, modes of not modes of being, but a different uh, logical structures. Compared to mm -hmm. the stage, yes. Yeah, it is interesting. Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, like now, now that you mentioned it, I think I remember Holgate mentioning that point about reversibility. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what to think about that because reversibility is like I think there is gonna be something uh, about. When you say two things are reversible, yeah, I think we should we should delve into this in when we talk yes. about our concerns because I don't have much to say about it now. But right. like intuitively, I think there is something about reversibility that kind of undermines the difference. Like there is a difference, and that difference right. matters. And I think that is uh, that is going to be important. I'm not sure if the idea of reversibility can yes. um, save that. Yes, but we can I, talk about this when we're talking about the concerns. Yeah, yes, I, I totally agree with you. We should definitely um, address this sort of fully in our um, concern episode. Um, and for the moment, I'll keep my intuition at this stage. I think that perhaps the mutually reciprocating is the better uh, term to describe what has been established so far. That something is an other to the other and the other is a something in its own right but whether the two structures are reversible in the alike I see. yeah yeah that's, that's strict an or the, uh, uh, st stricter or the most uh, uh, co commonsensical meaning of the term i am not uh, sure at this moment yes we can yeah that's an, that's an interesting that's an interesting point yes let's talk, talk about that in, in the next round when we talk about the concerns now, the last thing that happens here is actually not hard to decipher if what we have seen so far makes any sense, because it's a very similar point that we said about negation, right? right. So with, with negation, we said, you know, if you say negation, you got to go for it. Like it's right. negation is not, it doesn't have any end in place. Like, we don't know what, what it ends, right? And if the, it's a negation, it, the negation should be applied to the something as a whole, and then we have the birth of the other. Now, do the same thing with other, right? The same idea behind the movement from Dasein to something and from something to the other happens again. If the other, which is at the same time any something, right, is a truly other, the otherness must be applied to itself as well. It cannot, in other words, just be other than a something external to itself, but other than itself, internally speaking, right? Like, it seems like that it's, it's in a funny way, it is opposite, like, issue that we had, right? 
with negation in before something from determinant to being to something, um, we started from like negation being operated internally, right? We just, we were that in, in that space. We're just like, okay, these are two things, parts, moments of this negation, you know, negates itself and that's self relation, right? And then we said that, okay, okay, we have applied negation internally, but what about negation about this whole thing, which implies, you know, external point? And then we got the other. And with other, we're just like, okay, we have, you know, with other, we have this external differentiation. We, we, have, we have this yeah, othering in terms of difference from others, external difference. But this othering should be applied internally as well as externally. If this is other, if it's truly other, again, we don't need to, we, we have no choice other than to stop. We cannot stop. There is no reason to stop. And if we don't stop, we need to apply other to the other, which means the process of self-othering. The other must, the other, which is, you know, has any something has that structure as well, must other itself internally as well as externally, right? And this process of self-othering is what Hegel calls change. Change. Get rise is thus necessarily the eternal recurrence of otherness, the recurrence of the same old other. And we just, you know, we stop here, but, you know, a couple of things are important. Other emerged, other was externally applied, but other was unleashed instead of like negativity in a, you know, immediate way. Not even in a direct way, other now is kind of getting unleashed, and it was externally applied, now internally applied. This is still othering, this is change. Now, Olgate cannot stop reminding us that the category of time hasn't been introduced, right? So, change is not about time, or it's not, it's not about time. But a change logically precedes time. You can think of change without thinking about time, according to Hoge's interpretation of Hegel. And uh, yeah, this change is uh, not something that is, this change itself in being constant change becomes a constant later on, but we don't need to worry about that. The idea here is that the same idea of unleashing negativity that gave us other happens in the other itself and it gives us change. Yes. Okay. Uh, well, listening to what you were saying and uh, leading a slightly prepared, I had a kind of a thought. We can definitely um, further discuss it in a future episode. Is, um, is it fair to consider, at least to insert in this specific context, that other, in the sense of being othering and self-othering, is a further qualified mode of negativity or negation, in the same sense that uh, while moving from being nothing, absolute contrast, to the incompatible, incompatibility of coexisting, um, that the purity of absolute difference is purged. And here is like a further qualification in the sense that it's not um, just negation in the sense of negation that a category tries to stay away from reality, but also is more towards mutual relating and the mutual constituting in the relationship between something and other. Like it's a different or more complex sense of negation, the very concept of other itself. And if so, that's a very coherent or congruent with the unleashing negativity because it is a mode of negativity. So it must be unleashed to the utmost level, therefore including not just the external thing, but also internal structure. So from negation, it moves from 
inward outward, but like othering is from outward inward. So we from othering from another to affirm self of something, we get something called self othering that is called change. That's my yes reaction. I I, I think yeah, I think that's the point that you're making is exactly what is happening in the sense that. Othering and other is an extension of negation or oh, negativity, mm. general negativity. negativity. Further, yeah, qualified. We can yeah. definitely revisit and maybe like uh, make a slide on that. Like it's what the second point I want to uh, say, and we can wrap this up is um, I cannot. My, my I, when I was reading this, I just I, re I wish I read this much earlier before I like, decided to be a, a cultural historian because um, most models of say general theory of like culture or, or, or history always leave me unsatisfied to a large extent and this one's the only one that really sings to my heart and makes me joyful in the sense that to have that's my reading us the cultural historian Hegel's text per um, Hogan's interpretation of mediation is to have to hold fast to a specific, say, cultural identity, um, self-othering or change is it's the nature of holding on to identity. Let's think of the language, for instance. Every speech act is placed in a new, new context. Therefore, it's a different to a certain extent from any previous utterance of that language. However, a language exists only in so far as it embraces that inevitable inevitable change and the same category could be applied to say culture or maybe even institutional identity and the most commonsensical um, cultural historical theory basically try to essentialize certain things like when analyze say any specific activity in medieval europe or imperial china we already know the limit or the essence of being, say, medieval European and being imperial Chinese. Whereas if we take this mode, which I think is definitely several degrees um, removed, this Hegel is not talking about any concrete being and or like a, any cultural phenomenon in this state, but I think this logical structure really helps us to re radically reconsider um, the basic premises of cultural history, that there's no essentialized identity or for language, culture, or say state. However, that does not mean it does, they don't exist. They exist in the sense that it change. Um, it changes itself and it, uh, uh, it, it exists. It, it has a certain self-rejecting, self-othering structure that is independent from its environment. So I think that's a, I'm just like a very, very, uh, how to say, inspired while reading uh, this passage. And I really want to see what is the most responsible and constructive way to bring, say, Hegel's science of logic into the um, appreciation of many other things beyond the strict academic definition of uh, logical philosophy. Yes. That's, a, that's fascinating. I love that. And I think it is interesting. Yeah, the example of language is very interesting. And uh, like, a, you know, I, I've been thinking about the question of human nature and like right. the question of the universal and the particular in that sense. And like, I've been thinking about like the parallels with like the, the biological understanding of humanity and that kind of like constant variation in the evolutionary sense, right? It's just like this constant, like it's, to be a living being just like it has that implication of variation after variation after variation right. after variation that's kind of a stagnation doesn't exist but at the same time how could we have that how could we have that how could we have this kind of a in a weird way right to have an identity to be something requires to just not remain the same right how could we do that how could we think of change as something fundamental and at the same time think about identity right because these two seem to um like contradict themselves in, in, a, in a you know at a level but it is fascinating that when we think about 
And I think this has emerged in our conversation over and over again. I don't think it's an accident. The case of language is very interesting because in a very odd way, it just represents what we are saying, right? That language is just a constant movement is of just new, just, you know, this, this change doesn't stop. But somehow we still can talk about the English language, right? right? And this type of a relationship between like putting aside the old conception of essence, which seems to be thinking about these are the, you know, essential properties of something. And in so far as these essential properties remain the same, this thing is what it is, right? Hegel could not hold that. It doesn't seem like that is available to him. Um, that, that, that type of an essence is available to him. But bear in mind, the second part of this book is called Doctrine of Essence, right? So he definitely has an idea of what an essence is. What is an essence if change is fundamental? And I think the more we get into this kind of like understanding is that there are a lot of these patterns that exist in this in this book that does not require our full allegiance to the idea of absolute eminence, right? Mm -hmm. uh, like they could have different functions. We try our best to make sense of that too. But I think that these perils are valuable even if Right. Uh, we just realized that this is not imminent, at least in the way um, Hegel implies. But yeah, that's that's I think a very very great the co in continuation of this discussion how this could be applied um, to to other issues, and hopefully we will be able to um, talk about all of these um, implications later on. All right. I think with that we could say goodbye to our dear listeners and wish them a great day <laughs> any day and uh, yes yeah we're we'll gonna be back reconvene and a uh, short uh, interval yes indeed stay tuned dear listeners uh, we'll be back in a couple of weeks bye